I'm so very pleased to welcome Sarah Finlayson. It's been such a long time since I last saw her, so I'm very pleased. <laughs> yeah, it really has. <laughs> our invitation for our third Scribo seminar for 2021. Another Aegean topic, we had Godard, Professor Godard for our first one, and today we have Dr. Sarah Finlayson, who is a researcher at the University of Heidelberg in Germany on a very exciting project, which she will probably touch upon during her Scribble seminar today, or so I hope. The title is Ercon 3D, Development and Contextualization of Aegean Seals and Seal Impressions through 3D Forensics. Sarah is a top Aegean specialist who has written on materiality, epigraphy, social identity, cultural intersection between writing and people. And she's written a PhD thesis on a comparative study of the archaeology of writing in the Bronze Age Aegean, which was finished in 2014 um, from the University of Sheffield under the supervision of Professor John Bennett, who's here with us today. Hello, John. Great to see you too which is an overview of all writing practices as broadly defined as possible and how scripts were written, how they were read, how they were spoken, and even how they were not written. So this is a very interesting, intriguing uh, aspect. The scriber today touches upon the Aegean, of course, but we have a cognitive twist. And talking of which, note that our next Scribble seminar in two weeks time on the 31st of March will be on cognitive things too, but related to numbers with Karen Lee Overman and the concrete versus abstract concept behind written numerical notations. Sarah, over to you, looking for readers in the Bronze Age Aegean. Thank you, Sylvia, for the very warm introduction. I am honoured to be invited to contribute to this seminar series. So this afternoon, I'm going to talk about reading in the Aegean Bronze Age. And this is something I've been thinking about for quite some time now. But three things have happened over the past year, which have really brought the act of reading into focus for me. So this is very much a COVID inspired paper. And I must apologize now for the wobbliness of some of my slides. I haven't been able to get hold of everything I've wanted, everything I've needed. So I will start with the most trivial observation. I have become almost hyper aware of the books visible behind people in Zoom conferences. It's really fascinating how often people appear on screen flanked or surrounded by their bookshelves, like an academic armor. And I'm sure I'm not the only person who tries to identify titles to see what books colleagues choose to have around them as they work. The blurring of private and professional boundaries, which has been caused by home working and our necessary move to online communications, is going to fuel sociological research for years to come. But for my part, I wonder how many of us are using our academic book armor as a way to keep hold of our identity as it feels increasingly eroded the longer we're not in our institutes and our libraries. Second observation is that working at home, I've been relying much more on online publications and also on PDFs of scanned documents shared by colleagues. So the physical and virtual materials that I'm interacting with as I read have broadened I've been grappling with why I hate reading papers online so much. And I've reflected that my own reading experience, the way I most enjoy reading, is very bound up with the material that carries the written text. And this relationship between material support and reading practice will be different for each of us. So some of you may shudder at my dog-eared and post-it note hedgehog of a book and reach for your Kindle. 
But the myriad interactions between what is written and what it's written upon affect all aspects of reading, from how you handle and view the material up to the kind of status that you afford the text. So my third observation was actually prompted by a question from a student. I was giving an undergraduate seminar on Aegean scripts. And in trying to explain some of the peculiarities of Linear B, I talked about how the Linear B syllabograms do not always record all of the phonemic elements, all of the sounds present in words. So, Linear B has open syllables, but the language it records, which is Greek, contains consonant clusters. And this meant that spelling rules had to be established to, to bridge over this disjunction. And this is the example I was discussing in the seminar. The word is sperma, which is seed grain. But because you cannot write an initial S before a consonant, or an R before a consonant, according to the rules, it ends up as pema, or sometimes pemo. My student asked how a Mycenaean would write this tablet. Sorry, how a Mycenaean would read this tablet. This is one of those deceptively simple questions that, like a stone dropped in water, causes expanding ripples of additional and increasingly disquieting questions. How would a Mycenaean read this tablet? Would he or she read Pema? Or would they mentally expand these two signs to read the full Greek word signified? Would they read in their head or out loud? And as the outermost and most disquieting question, would anyone actually read this tablet? So I will unpick some different aspects of these kinds of questions of how people read, what they read, what significance might have been from different directions in the course of this paper. But I won't pretend that I can provide any definitive answers. And I think actually I'm asking more questions than I'm answering, but this is very deliberate. Our understanding of writing practices in the Bronze Age Aegean has become considerably more nuanced over the last couple of decades, but there is still a great deal that we do not understand, and reading remains particularly under-researched. For those of you who are very familiar with all of this, hopefully I can provide some food for thought. And for those of you working in different time periods and different places, I hope this gives you an introduction into the fascinating but very challenging Aegean material. So I'm going to talk uh, about what reading is, a little bit of cognitive science, but very basic cognitive science, before unpicking what archaeological evidence for reading practices in the past might look like. And then I will move on to a very meandering discussion of the Aegean material. Before I get stuck into what reading is, I should note that I, along with many other scholars researching ancient writing and marking practices, broadly follow the social model of literacy. Brian Street's original model was based on anthropological research on literacy practices in 1970s Iran, but it's subsequently been picked up and really worked on and expanded by other authors. The key point uh, to pull out is that the nature of reading and writing practices is dependent on the contexts in which they're embedded. So literacy is not neutral and, autonom and autonomous, but shaped by its socio-cultural, political and ideological setting. There's no single uniform and universal model of literacy but instead diverse historically and culturally variable literacies in the plural. And this approach seems eminently sensible considering the variability, the slipperiness of much archeological material. Not only to honor the particular shape a practice has in a specific geographic and temporal setting, 
but also to make space for multivalence in people's motivations and their experiences, and also in our interpretations of them. It's significant, I think, that the UNESCO definition of literacy has been refined over time to become similarly pluralist and, and socially embedded, focusing on the acquiring of the skills needed to successfully participate in one's own society. Literacy and illiteracy are not mutually exclusive and precise categories. There are many ways to be literate. People can learn to read and write, but then forget, or they can have few opportunities to use their skills. One person's self-definition of useful literacy might be perceived by someone else as merely functional or stunted. And not being able to read does not prevent one from listening to others' reading and participating in discussion with them. So what is reading? Reading is the process of extracting and making meaning out of signs, whether glottographic or semiseographic. Houston, in his paper on the archaeology of communication technologies, says um, very laconically that reading is a process of scanning and response. And it contrasts with writing, which is a mechanical and a kinetic act. So first, one scans the writing bearing material with the eyes, or in the case of things like braille, with the fingers. The brain takes this visual and tactile information and decodes it. That is, it assigns meanings and sound values to each element. The eyes scan over the text with a mix of short, rapid movements and stops. And certainly in alphabetic writing, some words are read letter by letter, while others, even quite long, are reconstructed from their length and shape with all letters processed simultaneously. Most of the brain is involved in this, but particularly the visual word form area. Our brains evolved long, long before writing was developed. And this area, which shows very strong responses to visual categories, including faces and tools, has been stretched to also respond to written marks. Acquiring literacy increases the efficiency and amount with which the visual word form area interacts with the entire left hemisphere spoken language network, which includes Wernicke's area, responsible for comprehending speech, and Exner's area, which is involved in planning and executing motor movement. So for example, handwriting. And the literate brain is able to decode these visual stimuli because it's been trained. It's learned the writing system and its orthography. The orthography provides the rules and the cues for the eyes and the hands, as well as for the brain. So which way up do you hold a book, for example? Does the script run from left to right? As well as the much finer details like spelling, pronunciation and conventional meaning. Individual signs are identified through a combination of local features which can be very minute, like the number of strokes making up a sign, and global features, which are combinations of several signs and their context. The extraction of meaning is not entirely a neurological process, though. And this is why I said in my definition that reading can be making meaning. Meaning is built up out of the text's semantic content for sure, but also the factors specific to an individual reader, such as their expectations based on textual and contextual cues, on their experiences of previous interactions with written material, their current situation, even their worldviews. We could all read the same text but what we take from it would differ depending on factors as small and definable as whether we've read it before 
to as large and nebulous as our educational background or our social class. Reading is a situated activity. And I quote, excuse me, I quote Laura Stepponi here, it positions one in a web of culturally stipulated relations between bodies, minds, and texts as artifacts and symbols. The specific socio-cultural setting holding together text and reader is absolutely key. Now, I'm using socio-cultural setting as a very stretchy term to mean all of the people who are producing and consuming written materials, who are enmeshed in reading and writing practices, together with the social, cultural, political and economic factors which shape, motivate and constrain their behaviour. So all of this together determines what value reading is afforded within a society, who gets to do it, how, what materials and contents are appropriate. This broader setting is also what diffuses or negotiates the tension between the need for socially agreed conventional meanings and the possibility of multiple individual readings. In contemporary Western culture, reading has a high value in both political and economic terms and socioculturally. So in the UK, sociological research has established a correlation between the early introduction of reading with children within the family and improved educational outcomes and increased opportunities for social mobility. Now I'm going to pass swiftly over the COVID homeschooling in the UK, which has brought to light radical failings of current and previous governments' approaches to teaching literacy. And instead, I will point to an extremely significant and much more joyful aspect uh, of reading, which is foregrounded by the Book Trust. Reading is not only socio-culturally useful, it's also pleasurable. We read by ourselves or aloud to our children. We listen to audiobooks and we join book clubs because it's enjoyable. And this widely accepted cultural value is not afforded in the same way to the act of writing or to numeracy. And I would very much like uh, in the discussion at the end to hear from anyone who can honestly maintain that they enjoy writing more than reading. I would like to suggest, because of all of these factors, that of all the practices bundled under literacies, reading is probably the hardest to examine with a coolly dispassionate academic mind. So how do you go about identifying the reader in the archaeological record? At least theoretically, the existence of writing presupposes the existence of readers. However, while writing has a material correlate in the written text, reading can be a completely invisible process. If enough written material has been excavated, we can potentially identify a script community, which is a group of people using that writing system over a period of time in a consistent way. The idea of the script community presupposes mechanisms of teaching and learning to enable the writing system be, to be transmitted and sustained. While one can study this material to reconstruct how the writing system operated, its orthography, even how many people wrote the surviving material, it's very much harder to identify how reading was practiced and by how many people and what value it carried. Generally, we suppose that readers outnumbered writers in the ancient world, but literacy levels were always extremely low and reading and writing primarily the preserve of elites within society. And this problem of how to 
quantify readers and qualify their skills continues to be an issue well into the modern historical period. So as seen, for example, in the scholarly debate over whether you can use the presence of a signature on an official document as a proxy for wider reading ability. I present uh, for your interest an extract from my maternal grandmother's birth certificate, which shows the X her father made because he was unable to sign his own name. That Pat Folan, and in between the Pat and the Folan, there's an X, and the registrar has written his mark. Now, there are, of course, exceptions to this, particular ways in which readers are visible in material culture. And the examples um, I will give now, they're not an exhaustive list. I'm sure there are plenty of others, but I've tried to select illustrations from different periods and places within the ancient world broadly defined, each of which offers up a different perspective on reading at that particular moment. So the first is explicit references to, writing, to reading practices made in texts. Amongst the, the very rich documents and correspondence of the Hittite Empire, for example, which have recently been brought together in a very interesting publication, which I'm using here, there are references to the practice of reading aloud documents for ceremonial effect and as part of rituals or uh, even during administrative processes. Now, in this extract here, someone else is reading the tablet aloud, probably a court scribe. And this doesn't imply that the king couldn't read, but within the context of the celebration of a successfully negotiated marriage treaty, which is what they're doing here, it's presumably more appropriate for the political theater to have your scribe there to perform for you. Letters also contain instructions relating to their reading, many of which are probably stock formal phrases, but there can be postscript editions addressed from the scribe writing to the scribe reading, and they're not intended to be read by anyone else or to be read aloud. My stylus broke. Clearly um, an in-joke between the, the two scribes. And it's worth flagging here that reading silently and reading aloud do not exist in opposition. A reader can do both. But the social context and the material provide rules or cues as to which is more appropriate. The reader can also be depicted in uh, visual material culture. Here, I got stuck with trying to find examples before we get into classical Greek painted pottery. We actually have a relatively large number of images from Egypt and the wide cuneiform world of scribes with their writing materials, but I'm not aware of any readers. And if anyone knows, I would very much like to hear. I wonder if this is significant. A writer has clear props identifying him as such, as you can see in these two images. But perhaps there was not the same widely agreed idea of what a reader looks like. What we do have are statues, monuments and so on, which position the viewer in the role of the reader. This is not uh, a sign of widespread popular literacy, though. Hammurabi's Code Steely makes for a powerful and very ominous statement of his control over every aspect of your life, even if you can't read a word of it. The rules apply to you regardless. We also have uh, examples which are physically impossible for mortals to read inscriptions on Egyptian temple walls, which are too high to be visible to anyone except for the gods, for example. So clearly not all writing needed to be readable for it to be powerful and efficacious. We're on rather firmer ground with what we might call the infrastructure of reading. 
physical locations like bookshops and libraries known either through excavation or again through their appearance in written materials of various sorts. Bookshops and libraries exist to serve the needs of readers. The first public libraries in Rome were founded in the 30s BCE and booksellers were already well established by then. It created a sort of literacy district. The area became a place to hang out. The layout of the shops, including seating areas, more or less required loitering, as Peter White puts it, and that's something that I'm sure will resonate with many of us. These bookshops speak to a regular demand for buying books, newly published, old, specially commissioned, because reading is now a recognised activity. In fact, it's more than that. There's a sort of hyper-literacy being used to define a particular kind of elite identity, literacy as social performance. There's a reading culture in which not only can one pleasurably read alone, but books are also read and debated, their meanings negotiated, in text-centred events, which act as a space for displaying one's own literary knowledge and insight, but also one's social connections. Lastly, the act of reading can be trapped and made visible as subsequent interventions into or on the text, corrections, marginalia, my post-it notes and dogged pages. These can break down and recreate the written text in a very physical way and are a part of this making of meaning which goes beyond semantic decoding. What's interesting here is that practices like annotations or markings disrupt the intended reading of the text. They form a cognitive scaffolding that supports a more selective and targeted attention. By reducing the complexity of the text, you can identify only the most relevant information without having to read or reread everything. Corrections are also highly significant here. The reader has evaluated the text and found it to be wrong in some way that cannot simply be passed over. In order for the text to be meaningful in future readings, it must be corrected. And I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that in many acts of correction, there is an implicit or explicit criticism of the reader. So let's look now at the Aegean material. Now I'll start with a very quick overview. So the Bronze Age starts in the Aegean around 3100 BCE. Scattered subsistence farming communities have gradually expanded into something more complex. And during this period, there's good evidence for the domestic use of seals and ceilings on Crete and on mainland Greece. And at sites like Lerna on the mainland, this took place at really quite a large scale, presumably community wide. A wave of destructions at the end of the early Bronze Age on the mainland brings this early seal use to an end, but on Crete it intensifies in the late pre-palatial and in the first palace period, which is roughly 1900 to 1700 BCE, we have two scripts, Cretan hieroglyphic and linear A which are used alongside seals in writing assisted administration in palaces and in elite settings. Now following uh, another series of destruction events, Cretan hieroglyphic went out of use at some point probably during the second palace period, which is 1700 to 1425 approximately. Linear A usage spread widely, both within Crete and beyond, and again, it's in both palatial and non-palatial elite context. Yes. Life goes on, <clears throat> excuse me, with further destructions into the late Bronze Age, when we now have small states centered, centered on palaces on the mainland as well. And there is a third script, 
Linear B, which records an early form of Greek, as I've said, and is developed out of Linear A. It's used initially at Knossos on Crete, and then soon after at mainland palatial sites. There's a final series of destructions around 1100 BCE, and that's the end of the Bronze Age. Writing disappears, and there is a period of illiteracy. There are two significant features about Aegean writing. The first is the complex and intertwined relationship between seal use and writing. Seals come first, writing develops somehow out of seal use, and the relative significance allotted to seals and writing shifts over time. The second thing is the extremely strong link between writing and administration. Both of these factors are, I think, observed in other early writing systems as well. For each script, the primary, primary material used was raw, unbaked clay, incised or stamped. But in the Second Palace period, we also have good evidence for the use of parchment. We have a kind of ceiling, a flat base nodule ceiling, which shows the imprints of parchment documents on their undersides. And there's also, from this period, a small group of stone vessels and jewellery with incised or engraved texts. They have no administrative purpose. So the clay documents were all preserved entirely by accident when the buildings containing them were burnt down. So what we have are a series of completely random snippets of writing practices at particular moments. And they must be pieced together in order to reconstruct the broader writing and administrative practices. Because Cretan hieroglyphic and linear A remain undeciphered, and the number of documents is really embarrassingly small, we're heavily reliant instead on the contextual and the material information for understanding what the documents were doing. The corollary of this is that because Linear B is readable and there's a significantly larger corpus of documents, there's always the temptation for teleology or for projecting back clearer aspects of Linear B practice onto the much murkier earlier periods. So we can certainly identify script communities in the Bronze Age Aegean, the core of people who made and used Cretan hieroglyphic linear A and linear B documents. And we have the documents themselves where they were found and their contents where we can read them to give shape to these communities. If we want to move beyond the writers and look for the readers, the limitations of the evidence become clear. The Aegean is missing a lot of the media I discussed above. There's no literature, there's no visual representations of readers, there's no visual representations of writers, and there's no self-referentiality. The texts contain no reference to the acts of reading or writing or being an administrator. Nevertheless, I think we can get some glimpses, some clearer than others. My starting point is the issue of readability. As I've said, we cannot read Cretan hieroglyphic and linear A. Some ideograms have been more or less securely identified, and many linear A syllabograms share a sign form with the later linear B signs, so we can infer some sound values. So it's possible to say the tablets recorded agricultural produce, craft items, people's activities, but we can't really go much further. And this is a source of considerable frustration, which leaks out, I think, in our preoccupation with the tablet's messiness and their irregularity. And I have to say, I am quite hopeful that the application of digital research methodologies, as is being carried out in the INSCRIBE project, will be able to extend our understanding of what's going on with these scripts. I very much have the feeling that over the last few years, many of us have felt very stuck, like we've come to the limits of what we can do with the material. 
So hopefully these new digital uh, methodologies can shake things up a little bit. In the meantime, I would suggest that we really embrace and engage with our temporary illiteracy. It's extremely difficult for highly literate people immersed as we are in a particularly rarefied kind of relationship with writing and reading practices to think ourselves into the perspective of someone who cannot read. One of the consequences of this is a tendency perhaps to overestimate the extent to which people might be able to puzzle their way through a document by decoding the ideograms. The problem with ideograms is it's very hard to gauge how readable they are. And Piers Kelly, in his fascinating paper at the recent Inscribe workshop, pointed out that visual iconographic conventions are very context specific. How can outsiders evaluate the relative iconicity or abstract nature of signs or infer meaning without instruction? Now looking uh, at this chart here, Cretan hieroglyphic is the left on each of the columns. It's not unreasonable to say there might be a sliding scale of guessability with the signs that maintain what Houston calls an existential tether to real world reference, potentially more easy to decode. But beyond this, you would need to learn the agreed meaning in order to be able to decipher the sign. If you remain outside of the system of socially agreed conventional meanings, because you lack opportunities to learn the script, for example, you're not necessarily prevented from making your own meanings, drawing on your expectations of what would be likely. And this is one of the elements of functional literacy, actively pulling together your own most meaningful readings based on your particular knowledge and experiences in order to get through the process you must participate in. And this is a very frivolous, but unfortunately also true example from my current state of basically functional literacy in German. Whereas Linear B tablets have clear rules for their layout, which ensure consistency and provide guides to reading, Cretan hieroglyphic and Linear A are written considerably more erratically. Things like word separation, ruled lines, marks to indicate where to start reading are found, but they're not used in any way consistently. It's even possible to write signs which are oriented on a vertical axis both ways round. There's not a lot of help here for the less skilled or experienced reader. And to who from whom I compiled this information points out that we don't notice these sorts of reading aids until they're not there. We underestimate how reliant we are on them for making meaning out of text. What might prove more helpful are the contextual clues to prompt reading. The range of Cretan hieroglyphic and linear A document shapes is very wide, particularly with the ceilings. It looks very much like the different shapes are meaningful. The shape is part of how the document works and it also signals this. But what exactly is it that's being read? There are multiple pieces of information on this ceiling. There's incised text on three faces. There's seal impressions which might, as on this example, contain Cretan hieroglyphic signs themselves. There's the overall shape of the document. Separate from the document, there are the seals that made the impressions. And how one reads a seal is worth a lecture in itself, if not a conference. And you can move potentially even further out to encompass the physical location in which the document is being made and used the people involved in their relationship, or the network of obligations in which they're enmeshed. And in the broad context of making meaning as you read, 
Each of these components contributes a piece of information about the overall transaction, and each is encoded differently, requiring a different kind of knowledge to unpack the meaning. How you read a ceiling like this, which of the pieces of information you place most weight on, depends on your reading ability, your familiarity with the process, and the extent to which you're actively engaged in assembling this meaning. It does beg the question of whether everybody is reading the same message and whether it matters if they're not. How far people were able to learn the skills necessary to participate in administrative activities, how much of the linear A or Cretan hieroglyphic scripts they could read is unknowable. Much depends on our recreations of these practices and the upwardly mobilizing redistributive systems that lay behind them. Were they open and inclusive with all participants fully knowledgeable and engaged? Or were they exploitative, relying instead on many people's inability to read the documents they were forced to interact with? The second part of the puzzle, as it were, is physical location. In order to be able to read, you need to have access to the written material as much as you need access to the literacy skills. You need to be close enough to see you perhaps need to handle the writing support yourself to manipulate it so you can read all of the text. If we make a rudimentary sort of map of where Cretan hieroglyphic and linear A writing might be visible, we have potentially some interesting patterns. The documents that can carry a longer text, tablets, various forms of bar, parchment documents, to which single hole hanging nodules were probably attached. Some of the flat base nodules, ceiling parchment, these all belong within structures, within palaces and elite complexes. They could only be read by people who were allowed into these spaces. At the boundary between these inner and outer zones are ceilings which mediate transactions between the central authority and the outsiders. Using the example of roundels again, the person in charge of the storeroom, perhaps, and the recipient of the goods together make this ceiling to record their transaction. This would be a good candidate for a situation where the reader relied heavily on contextual clues, I could perhaps only read the ideogram representing the item he or she delivered or received. Then there are traveling ceilings. Crescents, uh, which I showed earlier, come into the palace from the hinterland. Some flat base nodules definitely traveled and they're also nodulary. These ceilings could potentially be seen by anyone en route, not just those directly involved at the beginning and the end of the transaction. The flat base nodules are very carefully constructed so that the clay ceiling secures the parchment document underneath. Is this because there's a legitimate concern that the document might be opened and read between sender and recipient? That would certainly imply a moderately widespread reading ability. Perhaps rather there was a fear that people might be able to read it outside of the sender's control. The stone offering tables or vessels, which can have a linear A text carved into them, it's probably a dedicatory message, were also potentially more visible. They could be seen in processions at sanctuary sites. Who would read these? The dedicator, perhaps, priests, also perhaps, definitely the gods. I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that a written dedication or prayer implies that the gods can read. What about other visitors to the sanctuary site? Most vessels like these do not have a text, which suggests that the dedicators of the marked vessels wanted them to be differentiated, to be uh, 
looked at and possibly also to be read. The ring and the pins with linear A inscriptions also potentially exist in this sort of zone. They too have running text without idiogram. Much depends though on whether they're made specifically as grave goods, where they were all found in burials, or whether they were worn in life and therefore visible on the body. These are precious things, a prayer, a meditation, a dedication made tangible. And they do important work in mediating your relationship with the divine and also in advertising your status. Not only as a person who can commission a beautiful craft object, but also as someone who can call on the resource of writing in this way. All of these objects invite handling and interaction to turn the vessel round to follow the inscription or to run your fingers over the text as you fix the pin in your hair or your clothing. We use them as evidence for a moderately wide degree of literacy amongst the elite, which is completely reasonable. But one should still ask whether the owner or dedicator necessarily had to be able to read the inscription for it to be efficacious. If the wearer of this ring, for example, could read its inscription, did it have a fixed meaning, the same with each reading? Or did the meaning making depend on the moment? Whereas an administrative tablet has to have a fixed reading to be useful, the inscriptions on these richly charged objects are potentially much more fluid in how they can be read as the relationship with the divine is negotiated. So in this matrix of readability and visibility, there are these potential points of tension, things that could be visible and read outside of their intended context by anyone who had the requisite skills, for example, or between examples of writing that require a fixed meaning to be useful and those that are polyvalent or context specific. When we think about the kinds of reading skills people on Crete might have had during these periods, we need a spectrum that can encompass the functional understanding of an administrative process, right the way through to the use of narrative text in correspondence or ritual practices, and all the infinite gradations in between. So far, this has been extremely tentative and impressionistic. But when we focus on linear B practices, we have the opposite problem. There's almost a superfluity of detail. The way information was collected and managed is well understood. And we can reconstruct the general administrative cycle with consecutive stages of writing, reading and collating. So agricultural product, products, for example, come into the palace accompanied by ceilings. The data on the ceilings, which might be the sender or some details about the goods, are read and transferred onto a palm leaf tablet. Several palm leaf tablets recording related transactions are then read and compiled onto a page shaped tablet. Because such careful paleographic work has been done to identify individual writers, we can see that an important part of palatial administration involved the reading, compiling and summarising of information into different formats. So hand one at Pylos summarises on the EN and EP series of tablets data which he has extracted from EB and EO series tablets which are written by another scribe entirely. And while you can copy text without reading and understanding it, these acts of compilation and summarizing are much more complex activities. They require a high level of reading comprehension and also the broader contextual knowledge which guides you in extracting the most relevant information. If we look in at the very detailed level, one writer could read and correct another writer's tablet. So this is someone's very bad day in the office captured in clay. 
hand one has checked hand 21's tablet and he's made quite extensive corrections. This sort of direct intervention is unique at Pylos. At Knossos, uh, we do have examples of two different hands appearing on tablets, uh, one writing on each side. So there's a series of tablets dealing with cloth with one person writing on the recto and the other on the verso. While this doesn't directly suggest reading, it does certainly imply a very close cooperation in the making and writing of the documents. Now, so far, this reading has been integral to the ongoing quotidian administration of raw materials, people's activities, animals, and so on. And this is, after all, one of the use values of writing, not the only one. You cannot hold all this information in your head, so you put it in an external device which remembers it for you. At Pylos, there is an additional level though. And again, this is something very specific to Pylos. The higher level summary tablets were placed in what we conventionally call the archives room, where they're stored on shelves and baskets. Here, we should ask, once the documents were placed in the archives room, did anybody read them? We do have the tax records, which record debts carried over from the previous year. So administrators could clearly consult older records specific to tax payments. But what about all of the records of completed transactions where there was no outstanding obligation? Was there any further need to read them? Did anyone take down a random tablet just to browse? Or were the shelves carefully filled with neatly filed records because that felt like the right thing to do? The correct way to end the administrative cycle? Given the large and significant gaps in what is recorded in the Linear B documents, which suggests that the administrative system is very strongly shaped by non-utilitarian factors, we should certainly be open to the possibility that these acts of filing were primarily for the satisfaction of the process and there was no ultimate reader. It is ironic, I think, that the Linear B texts most likely to be visible outside of the palaces are those which we afford the least value. The painted inscriptions on stirrup jars, they're often hard to read. Sometimes it slides between a text and something more decorative in their detail. These inscriptions have a fixed meaning relating to the delivery of oil from producer to palace. But as the jars were used and reused, shipped between Crete and mainland Greece and back again, the possibilities for reading and meaning making completely unsanctioned by the palace were myriad. But at the same time, access to the skills required for these reading activities was radically restricted. I want to finish off now by unpicking just a little further the most fundamental and I suspect the most unanswerable question, which is, does a text need a reader? I said at the beginning that the existence of writing practices presupposes the existence of a reader, but does it really? A lot depends here on where you place most emphasis and value in definitions of what constitutes writing and what its purpose is. If you, for example, posit that the primary purpose of writing is to store information that at some later point in time can be retrieved, then you very much do need a reader. How clearly that reader is conceptualized or visualized, whether they're separate from the writer remains open and would presumably vary from script community to script community. And this is, I would suggest very much how we view reading and writing now, they're inextricably entangled. That has it always been so. Reading practices and skills in the Bronze Age Aegean encompass divine readers, skilled readers who made summaries and corrections, 
as well as readers who might actually have been reading in inverted commas the process and not the written text at all. Meanings could be fixed, they could be highly context specific, they could perhaps be negotiated or made up according to your own best judgment. Accessibility to materials bearing writing with both their intended and their accidental audiences shaped reading experiences as much as access to skills. Against such a background, I would suggest that reading and writing might not always have been so tightly bound together. And in fact, for consumers of Cretan hieroglyphic and linear A, there were reading opportunities and meaning making opportunities very separate from the initial act of writing, and perhaps sometimes in conflict with the idea of a single fixed message. For ceilings and for the inside stone vessels in particular, it's possible that there was often an unintended reader and an unintended reading. Linear B was different though. By pulling writing back into the palaces, making it an almost entirely inward facing practice that existed only within an administrative context, opportunities for reading were very much reduced. This must have been caused by or brought about a radical shift in how the activities reading and writing were conceptualized, what their relative values were within the Linear B script community. The fact that the Mycenaean gods do not receive offerings bearing writing and therefore presumably cannot read seems absolutely crucial here. I leave open though whether the change in practices came before or after the change in attitudes. Now, I would suggest reading and writing were just recurring points in the cycle of administrative activity. The Linear B administrators wrote, knowing that they or their fellow administrators would read texts if the process required it. The reader was no longer other, separate from the writer. In fact, the important thing was that something was written down there was not necessarily any expectation that it would be read. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sarah. This was fascinating, lovely. Um, I, I have loads of questions and I'm sure that the audience has many too. Uh, let me, uh, I'll ask with a question that wants to expand a little bit on the really engaging idea that there are readers who are not writers in Cretan hieroglyphic and linear A, and especially Cretan hieroglyphic, when it comes to the possibility of readers and writers coinciding when it comes to actually reading or understanding or having some sort of literacy process engaged uh, in, in the appreciation and the perception of the Cretan hieroglyphic seals, which are tiny little things. And the expectation of, I don't know, anybody who's gone to a museum to see these seals can notice straight away how difficult they are to read, to make out, to disambiguate the signs. Some of them are really legible altogether. So maybe if you would like to expand a little bit more on how sophisticated and advanced that perception may have been and who were the recipients of that um, sending off of the message of the Cretan hieroglyphic seals. In other words, was it just a, 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 a sort of a, an item that was meant to be recognized outside the administration and that's it? Or was there more of an engagement into reading it in terms of, let's say, iconic literacy, but not really making out the signs? I suspect all of those things. Seals are extraordinarily complex in how they can encapsulate so many different sorts of information. Their, their jewellery, their bodily adornment, their uh, a status symbol sometimes, they're beautiful, um, made of particularly beautiful stones or of gold, that sort of thing. And they also are used to make some sort of repeatable statement. And we assume that's a statement of identity. And that seems reasonable. 
Um, but I think it's also possible that it's other sorts of, uh, of statement. The key thing is that it's always um, repeatable. The problem with the Cretan hieroglyphic seals, they have a Cretan hieroglyphic text on them, but they're used alongside seals which don't, which have uh, their message somehow conveyed through the use of meaningful imagery. So whatever uh, system we have for meaning making, it has to include both of these options, which suggests to me that when you wear a seal and when you use it, there has to be potential for you to express, to explicitly state what its meaning is and how its meaning is, um, is expressed. Um, you, you have some sort of reading, some sort of meaning making of your seal. I would suggest um, that could happen at the act of making the seal impression. Um, but I guess the first time, I mean, if you're repeatedly making seal impressions, um, then presumably you become known to each other. But um, I think there's potential for these sorts of social negotiations to be done out loud. Um, I'm Sarah, this is my seal. Um, I have chosen this text. I've chosen these images. This is what it means. The other possibility, which we always have to bear in mind, is that no one did this. Mm -hmm. That what happened was that when I pitched up at the, the palace, you recognized me. Mm -hmm. And my seal was just uh, a formality. So again, we have to have one of these very stretchy mm -hmm. systems. Um, I, I personally, I very much like the idea of the um, the sort of expression, um, the verbal expression of meaning and, and the sort of negoti negotiation of it. And uh, this does fit with um, with some of the ways that that seal use ha have been analysed more recently. Um, uh, you know, it's it's much more of a kind of active social process. Um, it's not just solely about making an impression that has a kind of securing function. Um, so that sort of answers your question. It does, it does. I, I think it, again, it opens a horizon because of course the Aegean doesn't have any monumental writing. So there is no real large scale um, expectation to see readers really, because it seems such a navel gazing process. Questions from anybody. You can raise your hand or unmute yourselves, but by raising your hand, you will respect our etiquette, or you can write in the chat. Anyone? Barbara. Good evening. Thank you, Sarah, for this very rich uh, talk. I enjoyed it a lot. And uh, <laughs> um, in particular, I enjoyed the part in which you address God as readers and you highlighted how religion is linked to inscriptions and to writing practices in, in Crete in uh, uh, proto and neopalatial times. Um, and this uh, make me wonder um, whether re religious practices and the necessity to communicate with the divinity might be, um, the trig might be seen as the trigger for the invention and development of writing on Crete instead of administrative practices. Uh, since I, I also see this link, and um, so I agree with your, uh, with the remarks you made about this topic, so, yeah. <laughs> That's, that would be a very interesting perspective, and also not completely alien in the broader view of, of early writing. Mm -hmm. um, we have, uh, as you know, um, the, the earliest signs are on seals found in burials, um, the, the Akanis script. And at, 
that time we have no evidence for um, for administrative writing. So certainly socially and ritually significant writing appears to predate um, its transferal to the administrative sphere. Whether it would be specifically the, the ritual aspect and the need to, to mediate with the divine or whether it would be social forces more broadly, I don't know that we could, I, I don't think there's enough evidence at the moment to say either way. Um, it's, it's clear, you know, the, the Akana script seals there, they're obviously hugely symbolic in that they've been used as grave goods, but they're also playing on other socially powerful things like the, the use of very Egyptianizing imagery, that sort of thing. So they're, they're important and complex objects um, and they're, they're doing something, but whether we could narrow it down to say it was primarily uh, some sort of uh, ritual motivation, I, I don't know that we could do that yet. I mean, perhaps with a bit more, bit more evidence, we, we might be able to do that. But it would but be a very we, refreshing. Do we need the motivation for writing to appear? Do we? I wonder. I, yes, I don't know. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm half. I'm quite in favour of accidents and um, doing things that turn out not quite the way you expect. Um, <laughs> Yes, um, I, I don't think one necessarily has to suppose a very deliberate sort of now we must invent uh, writing because we have a, a specific need. Um, I, life is, is considerably messier than that and one's plans and one's intentions often get diverted and through serendipitous processes you end up with something that really resonates with you and then you can find meanings to to tie it into we have bill moulton who raised his hand bill hello uh, this has been a really good lecture i've really enjoyed it thank um, you did i hear you say that uh there are no inscriptions to the mycenaean gods if, if that's true it seems like a odd relationship the the linear b writings are with some very very small exceptions entirely administrative right so we have a great deal of information about the religious economy um, the tablets record offerings to divinities and their festivals and the provisioning of uh, priests and that sort of thing but we don't have anything like the earlier linear A little offering tables or anything like that. We don't, we also don't have any, um, any dedicatory inscriptions in, in sanctuary sites or anything like that. Interesting. Uh, thank thank you. you. Thank you, Bill. Aaron Collar, who's going to be one of our next Scribo speakers. Aaron, over to you. Um, so I have just one observation about the seals, and that's that in the Levant, certainly where we have both seals with writing and seals without writing, the writing sometimes hits up against the edge of the seal, so that when the seal maker then put on a bezel, it actually cuts through the writing, which certainly indicates that the writing was of secondary importance. It had to be recognizable, but no one was actually sounding out the writing, uh, even on seals that have writing. Um, but I have a, one broader question for you for a consideration. And that's whether there is a, a push and pull between writing and reading. Uh, I think broadly, scripts that are very easy to write tend to be harder to read. And that's true in our, our lived experience. And if someone scribbles a note or writes in a, a very quick cursive, uh, then that's harder to decode. Uh, something that's easy to read tends to be harder to write, more labor intensive and uh, laborious to produce. Uh, so I'm wondering whether you have thoughts on, on the interplay between the writers and the readers in that broad sense. 
that it's a really interesting point and there is this uh this interplay and yes yeah, it's a sort of a, a flow back and forth between the requirements of the readers in some way um sort of flowing back and forcing change or refinement in in writing practices and also in the other direction um, with readers having to adapt and meet uh, the, the written material that they come into contact with. I think the, the problem with um, these scripts, partly um, with Linear A and Cretum Hieroglyphic, because we can't read them. I, I think our our entire sort of frame of reference for discussing readability and writability is is distorted. It's somehow sort of corrupted by by our own frustration. Um, but it's interesting in that context that one of the things that people have observed with the uh, the linear A tablets is that they look like they're written in a hurry. And that is often um, taken to be that they are somehow an ad hoc record, which will then be tidied up and transferred onto a different kind of material at later stage. But I'm wondering now, based on what you've said, whether this uh, more sort of sketchy, spontaneous sort of writing might also have an implication for uh, for how it was read. I think I will have to, to think a little more about that. It's an interesting question, but I don't think with the material we have, I can necessarily answer it. That's perfectly fair. Thank you for the consideration. <laughs> Let me anticipate that Aaron is going to give us a, a scribble seminar on the 7th of April on the origins of the alphabet. So we'll keep you posted on the details. OK, there's a question in the chat. Is there any evidence with regards to the more international trade of the time, i.e. if these seals could be recognized by other Mediterranean populations at that time? That is a fascinating question. The, the Aegean throughout the Bronze Age is clearly trading back and forth. Uh, Crete with Egypt, um, also with uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, with the Levant and other areas. Um, and in the late Bronze Age, the Mycenaean palaces are exporting uh, things to, to the Levant but they are not obviously communicating with them. The seals in the Aegean are stamped. They're not rolled. So they don't fit into the, um, the sealing pattern of trading partners, um, which you know, may or, or may not cause problems, but we have no evidence that uh, written materials were being sent or sealed objects were being sent. The, the traded objects are certainly moving, but, but not any sort of paperwork, playwork associated with it. And actually the Aegean is in uh, written communication terms very much isolated. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, they don't receive any of the Amana letters or anything like that. So they're, they're doing their own administrative things, but within the boundaries of mainland Greece and Crete. They do show up in the frescoes, but yeah. Yes. <laughs> Any more questions? Judith Van Garten. Uh, the previous question was by Vivian, who sends her greetings from Greece. Uh, Judith, on linear A legibility, one should keep in mind the two ink inscribed cups from Knossos. 
uh, written by two different hands, one neat, the other one less so, and presumably the parchment documents would be as varied and were meant to be read. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And this is, um, this is the time when we have the best evidence for people potentially reading and writing across media. And it's an interesting thing to, to consider if you are accustomed to write with a stylus on clay, can you comfortably then write with a brush and ink on parchment? Does it, does it work? Um, and the same, if you are accustomed to reading from a clay tablet, what does it feel like to handle parchment, to unfold it, to unroll it? Mm -hmm. The the two uh, cups that Judith mentioned are are rather wonderful because the inscription is inside and it, it's circular. So this is also an object you have to unroll in your hands in order to be able to read it. It's a very uh, a very physical, interactive form of reading and difficult practice. and yes. difficult. How on earth did they paint that in? I have always wondered. <laughs> Any more questions? I have one actually, but I'll leave it to the last. Anyone? Well, I'll ask my question <laughs> on the invisibility of readers. I was really it kind of piqued my interest and my curiosity when you mentioned that you know writers, when they are shown show, showed in history, they, they are visible. We can we can actually make them out. They, they're, they're, they're visible, they're clearly identifiable. Um, would we expect, well, and readers are not, of course, um, would we, we expect the same or different props to be shown when we want to actually make readers visible? In other words, could we actually say that the props are basically the same? It's a, yes, it is an interesting question um, because the, the Egyptian scribes sitting cross-legged, a lot of them are looking very sort of introspective, <laughs> you know, they're, they're not, you know, actively writing, they're, um, they, they could be perusing what they've just written, mm -hmm. but the what one uh, reconstructs of the scribal identity is that it foregrounds the act of writing um, and you know your all of your paraphernalia for writing. Um, I, I find it the question of what a reader looks like is very interesting and when readers do become very visible for example uh, in the medieval period it's because they're doing something which is um, symbolically, or in this case, sort of religiously significant. You know, they're, um, they're a venerable monk and they're, they're reading the Bible because they have the insight and the learning in order to be able to partake in, in this practice. So in that way, you know, the, the fact that they're holding a book, the book is the prop and that signals all sorts of things about their identity and their, the, the significance of what they're doing. But you're, you're right, I mean, you, you just need something with text on it to signal, um, to signal a reader. But, but somehow it seems to me very clear that, uh, you know, the, the two cuneiform scribes out in the battlefield tallying booty, they're not readers, they're writers, mm -hmm. and that's why they're there. Any more questions? Aaron, again. Sorry, I have so many questions, but <laughs> I'll hold, hold myself to one right now. Um, and that's the, the broad distinction between archival and documentary texts on the one hand and literary texts on the other hand. Um, because of course, I don't, I don't know that this exists in the Aegean, I guess that's a question for you, but in, in Egypt and in Mesopotamia, um, so many of the readers are the later writers, and uh, you know the Egyptian uh, were very cognizant of the fact that they were sometimes writing for later generations. I, I, 
can't remember the reference exactly, but there's a, an Egyptian wisdom text that says, you know, people build monuments to their own deaths and, and tombs and graves, but those crumble into sand, but a text can be read and copied forever. So it's, you know, a scribe has sort of a, a more everlasting life than uh, even a noble nobleman. And um, that cognizance of the fact that a literary text uh, will be read is, uh, I'm sure it was often not fulfilled, <laughs> but at least that ambition uh, obviously presupposes one kind of reader, a, a very elite uh, scribe in training who's going to be copying. And all the, all the late Egyptian copies of Middle Egyptian texts and so on that we have obviously showed that some people were reading, um, if only as part of their training. I, I suppose the question is whether anything like that exists in the Aegean or is the Aegean, uh, uh, you know, everything could be ephemeral because everything is documentary and uh, non-literary i think the the scale of values is different they're doing different things the certainly for the mycenaeans with linear b things that are written down they they only have a lifespan of a year so i think there there is no sense of um, continuity even there's no sense of of sort of uh, preserving things into the future what they are doing though is storytelling and making meaningful imagery in their palaces and they're playing around with um with beads and that sort of thing. So they're, they're things that need to be expressed widely and that need to be, um, or that need to, that, that you partake in because you have a sense that they will last forever. They're not written. They are entirely oral or, or based in, in visual culture. And I mean, there are, there are various ideas for, um, for why that might be, but I would suspect that somehow there was a resistance to the idea of transferring, even if only partially, what was powerful in the spoken word in storytelling into written media. There must have been some some feeling that it that it wasn't right to do that it, it's interesting to think about what that implies for Mycenaean sense of the future and history and posterity and and all of those sorts of things I suspect they probably didn't think about it not in the same way as you know someone drafting their uh, their biography like the, the Hittite king, he wrote a biography because he wanted someone to know about him and to read about him. But if, I, we, if we did, we wouldn't see it through the linear B text, which mm -hmm. were not meant for that yeah. purpose, I guess. There's a comment by Cassandra Donnelly, linear A in Scripithoi might be one object with anticipated multi-generational readership. That's an interesting idea. Yes, they might. Um, exactly what, you know, how much uh, depth there is in the text on an inscribed pithos is, uh, yeah, is an interesting question. But yes, they, they certainly are. And actually, I would um, backtrack a little bit. Seals also. Um, with their, their just infinitely portable, transferable, um, the meanings are sufficiently slippery that you can hand them on, you can take someone else's and you can remake it and make it significant for yourself and your descendants. So there are things which have this aspect, do, but do not many. Do you think that seals may have been heirlooms as well, to an extent? Yes. Yes. Exactly how many years have to pass before something is an heirloom is a really difficult thing to, um, 
to get a grip of, but it's clear that seals could be curated. So the, uh, the traveling flat-based nodules that I showed in my slide, um, we have the same seal used to impress a ceiling from uh, late Minoan 1A at Kwateri, as is used 80 to 100 years later in late Minoan 1B at Sclavocan, Boss and Aya Triada. So that particular gold ceiling ring was curated for 80 to 100 years. Mm. Um, that one seems to have a particular political significance, but we, we have other examples where there are seals which are clearly older than their context. Whether it's an heirloom in the sense of something that is inherited down a particularly tightly defined line is harder to say. I would suggest sometimes yes and sometimes perhaps no. And actually we know from, um, this is something Judith has written about, um, Anatolian seals I think can be used by people who are not named on the seal. You know, they are, they slither around into different contexts. So yes, they can be heirlooms and also that cannot be meaningful. <laughs> And, and I mean, Judith and also Georgia Flu that is present, hello Georgia, can, can actually confirm whether some of these seals were not used at all, like they were not used phrygistically, they show yeah. no wear and tear on the surfaces, but I don't want to be mistaken on this one, I think, but I think there's evidence for that. Yeah, which is a fascinating thing that yeah. the, the world of seal ownership and the world of seal use meet exactly. but it's not a kind of one-to-one -one, if you have a seal you use it administratively they're yeah. multifunctional great any more question one more please and then we can wrap this up and say bye bye and thank our sarah Yorgia, an interesting question that needs to be pursued further indeed she says <laughs> Okay, on this note, I think we can say goodbye. It's not really a question, but it is a question worth pursuing further. Thank you so much, Sarah. It was fascinating, intriguing. It piqued my curiosity. I want to I wanna find more readers in the Aegean, really. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was wonderful. Thank you, everybody, for being here with us today. It was a huge success. Um, John Bennett says goodbye, uh, Georgia Fluda says many thanks for the fascinating talk. We will see you in two weeks time. We have currently Overman, uh, numbers, uh, abstract versus concrete numbers. Thank you so much from Miguel Valerio too. Um, we will see you in two weeks, same time. We will send the Zoom link uh, next week. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, Sarah. It was great. Thank you for having me. It's and been we, a pleasure. We will see you live, hopefully, shortly. Well, in due course, for sure. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Best wishes, Thank everybody. Bye-bye.